Hello and welcome to the first episode of a short series of podcasts entitled Sustainable Development Goals, Evaluating Progress for a Brighter Future. My name is Stefano De Rico, and I am Head of Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning at the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. In this series, we'll explore how the national policies and interventions are going to achieve sustainable development. Because sustainable development is every country's goal. But how we get there isn't always straightforward. Too often, projects and programs work in silos and ignore the interactions within, between, and around them. And these can hamper progress. That's where evaluation can play a part. Evaluation of progress against a particular sustainable development goal can identify the interdependencies between the social, economic, and environmental dimensions of policies and interventions. And now we have obviously come out of a key climate moment with COP26 and climate change, which are the most striking example of how action towards one goal can dramatically affect programs addressing the other sustainable development goals. So under new and very different climate conditions, the existing adaptation practices and processes will no longer be viable. And progress against other goals will be seriously undermined. Thus, it's vital that climate risks are identified and integrated into evaluations of different thematic areas, education, health, clean water, and sanitation, and all the other themes that are covered by the SDGs. So in this first episode, we are discussing how evaluators can do that. We'll hear what Kenya is doing, we'll think about the challenges, and also the best way to address those challenges by using a systematic approach. So without further ado, I will ask my guests to introduce themselves. My name is uh, Samson Machuka, and uh, currently uh, serving as a, a director of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, directorate within the National Treasury and Planning of the Republic of Kenya. And uh, evaluation has been one of our core uh, main activities uh, as far as monitoring and evaluation programs are concerned. And I'm Emily Beauchamp. I'm a senior researcher at the IIED in the Strategy and Learning Group. And my research focuses mostly uh, on the nexus between environment, climate and evaluations. And that means my work involves designing evaluative and research frameworks to assess progress in climate and development policies, but also working with national and local governments on evaluation and monitoring evaluation and learning systems. Hi, I'm Nick Brooks. I'm a researcher and consultant, um, and my work focuses on climate change adaptation, particularly on climate change risks and how we can integrate considerations of these risks into development, including sustainable development. I worked extensively on monitoring evaluation and learning issues around climate adaptation in both an academic and a practitioner context uh, in the space of international development. And I'm the director of Garama 3C, a small consulting firm based in the UK, and I'm a visiting research fellow at the University of East Anglia. So Nick, I've just talked about climate risk. Perhaps to start us off, you could tell us what we mean by that term. Sure, Stefano. Yeah. So there are lots of different types of climate risks. And typically in the field of international development, sustainable development, we're, we're thinking about risks associated with particular interventions, development projects, programs, uh, sustainable development initiatives, and so on. So when we think about projects and programs, particularly from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, we often think in terms of outputs and outcomes. So on the one hand, we can think of risks to a project's outputs and outcomes, and ultimately to the impacts that we want to see. But we can also think about risks from a project, from an intervention. Um, so we've got these sort of risks facing in two directions, to the activity we're, we're talking about and from the activity. So I'll say a little bit about those in turn. 
So we might have risks to uh, a project or an intervention's outputs. Uh, these obviously are things like goods and services we're trying to deliver in the short term. So this might be as simple as climate disasters such as floods or, or uh, storms, hurricanes, simply destroying uh, infrastructure that's been put in place by a project or preventing um, access to project sites, for example. We might also have risks to these project or program outcomes. We might be looking at an intervention to uh, enhance agricultural productivity. This could be climate smart agriculture, sustainable agriculture, or um, the objective of an intervention might be, for example, to uh, improve the health of a particular ecosystem or a particular set of natural resources. So this might all be very well under current conditions, uh, but as a result of climate change, we might find that we have things like water shortages, additional pressures on ecosystems and so on. And this might make it more difficult to achieve the outcomes. We might increase sustainable agricultural productivity for a while, but then find that as water resources uh, become more scarce, uh, that isn't sustained and perhaps can't be sustained in the future. We also have the risk of a, a project or an intervention being redundant. Um, for example, we might be looking at an intervention to try and sustain resources, natural resources, biological resources, for example, that simply won't be viable under climate change and that they'll just disappear. So we have to ask whether trying to sustain something that's ultimately not going to be there in the future it is sort of worthwhile. Uh, and these are really hard calls to make. So I'll say something briefly now about risks from an intervention. We might have an intervention that increases the vulnerability of a particular group of people. Uh, a classic example would be something like agricultural expansion that displaces pastoralists or, or makes it more difficult for them to access pasture during dry seasons, uh, making them more vulnerable to climate change and climate change impacts. An intervention might also increase environmental vulnerability. Uh, again, if we're looking at coastal developments, then these might create a sort of hard infrastructure that prevents coastal ecosystems migrating inland. Now, if we're looking at sustainable development interventions, hopefully we wouldn't be in that sort of situation, but that, that's a, a sort of a pertinent example there. And finally, if we fail to account for uh, and understand how climate change might change what is viable uh, in the future, we might create entire systems that are based on false premises. Uh, we might make uh, an entire economy or society or, or, or region dependent on resources that are not going to be there in the future uh, because of climate change. And why are climate risks important when it comes to evaluating progress against the Sustainable Development Goals? Yeah, so, I mean, this is the, the critical question, really. I think the, the bottom line here is that uh, something that is sustainable under current conditions might not be sustainable under future conditions because of climate change. So if we are ignoring climate change and we're evaluating a uh, sustainable development intervention and we're saying, yes, this looks great, it looks like it's going to be uh, economically sustainable, uh, technically financially sustainable, it looks like it's going to deliver the, the outcomes that are intended, uh, and we're not thinking about how climate change might alter the, the landscape, the context in which this intervention plays out then we might just be getting things completely wrong. So I think the task for sustainable development evaluation um, is to ensure that sustainable development initiatives, interventions, activities have taken the, these risks on board, because if the evaluation doesn't ask this, then it's pretty pointless, particularly in high-risk contexts. So what we are saying, really, is that it's vital to include considerations of climate risk in sustainable development evaluation and in as sustainable development goal evaluations. And Samson, I know that Kenya is doing this. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I think uh, what the, the question you're asking is very pertinent, uh, particularly to us as a country. And uh, you're asking that question at a time uh, uh, we have had just a big conference in Kenya involving uh, our governors, you know, we have governors who are heading uh, our 47 counties, and the theme of their discussion was mainly uh, climate change and how it poses uh, major risks in terms of our agricultural development. Uh, what I need to mention at this stage is that um, Kenya has taken climate change issues very, very, very seriously to the extent that in our Kenya Fusion 2030, it is one of the key pillars, key goals that is being focused on in terms of our planning processes. And therefore, climate change issues have been captured at national and account levels in their main five years manifestos and, and the development plans. So what we are doing is that uh, they have those programs and we have come up with critical indicators 
that have been put in place uh, to ensure that they are being tracked and therefore to make sure that the climate change issues are addressed uh, effectively in terms of uh, making sure that the, the, the green emissions are, are actually reduced uh, drastically over, over the five years plan. So it is one of our key uh, goals in our development agenda. And uh, I believe that uh, we are headed somewhere because our indicators are really po behaving positively in terms of making sure that uh, there is a lot of uh, responses uh, to, to the results of, 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 of the of the of the of the climate change uh, policies that are being implemented. And it's, it's great to hear that Kenya is really considering climate risk, um, not only in evaluation, but also in national policies. So I really wonder whether it's been always so straightforward. What I'm wondering is what kind of challenges you have encountered? Yeah, the, the kind of challenges we are facing here yeah, are definitely that um, climate change is not... Um, a one time or an instant uh, thing that can come to to, to to be addressed. It's a long term. So uh, the kind of challenges we are facing is that obviously resources have been a big problem and uh, also making sure that uh, the, the policies or the wish of the government to the people still takes time to be encultured. You know, to enculture the people to start addressing uh, uh, climate change issues is not... Uh, um, a very easy issue, but uh, nevertheless, it is going on. And then uh, I can also say that the lack of adequate resources, particularly in terms of um, making sure that sensitization programs uh, are taking place on time, and also making sure that evaluation uh, issues are, uh, are strongly mainstreamed in our uh, in, in in our in our laws and so forth. I think it's, it's where we have a, a slow uptake, but nevertheless, we are moving in and uh, we hope that, uh, that that will take shape. Lastly, maybe something else I can say that is that um, the other critical challenge, which I can also say is that um, coming up with the very, very, very smart uh, indicators that can uh, give us uh, evidence on the basis of how we are doing at climate uh, uh, policies effectively and how they are impacting the the, 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 the whole process is where we have a slight, uh, slight challenge because uh, it's not easy to get the actual data and it's also not very easy to, 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 to zero down to that uh, empirical uh, information that can now tell you for sure that this change is purely coming from the implementation of our, of our of our climate change aspect. So those, those those are the small challenges that we are facing, but I think with, the, with time, we'll be able to overcome. It takes a little while, but that's where we are. And we are getting uh, support from international community. We are also allocating, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, our policy, mandate policy, is already attracting 1% of the budget. And once we have those resources available with us, then we can now be able to have competent evaluators who can work the ground to make sure that they are kept getting credible source of information that can be used to inform policy in terms of how we are moving in, uh, in, 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 in changing the climate uh, aspects so that uh, we have amicable uh, progress in policy. So credibility of evidence is where we have that kind of challenge, particularly emanating from the climate change, so that we are able to report substantively that this is really where we need change, or this is what we need to change and uh, and, the, and, the, and influence policy uh, and so forth. So I think uh, it's a bit of a challenge, but we are, we are hopeful that we are moving, we are moving anyways. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Samson. And uh, <clears throat> I, yeah, I mean, I, the, it is it is really interesting to hear, uh, you know, how you are addressing these challenges. And I was wondering how this uh, uh, challenge, in light of the challenges and of the climate act that has been approved, how do you think evaluation is going to change in Kenya? How do you think evaluation is going to address these issues? That's a good question. We have, we have, we have prevailed uh, since uh, monitoring and evaluation policy has already been approved. Uh, the most important thing then is that now 
evaluation results will be required to inform policy because in the past uh, policies have not been informed by anything because we uh, policies have been made on, uh, on, on, on arbitrary basis. But now with the evaluation, uh, uh, evaluation reports coming out very well out of uh, well-researched uh, findings of the evaluators, then it's anticipated, it's actually required that, that those policies now, uh, the, 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 the reports must be able to influence and inform policy of what is required to be done. And therefore, the evaluations are going to be mainstreamed and be used by the implementers. But I think for climate change, climate change uh, requires elaborate uh, uh, evaluation so that uh, uh, that kind of evaluation can then be able to influence uh, government uh, budgeting system and policies so that uh, at least then we put in the implementation mechanisms to ensure that the results or the findings of those evaluations are implemented to the letter. And I think that way we can then be able to say that we are doing uh, something meaningful in terms of climate change uh, development. Thank you, Samson. And uh, Emilia, can, we, we heard from Samsung that Kenya has already got that far. Uh, it's already doing a lot to address climate in policies and in evaluation. Is that the same in all countries? Well, unfortunately, not really. Um, there is a spectrum of different experiences and levels of integration of climate in, in evaluative work. Uh, some countries have started to integrate climate issue, issues in the evaluative frameworks of the country. And some countries uh, are considering climate risk in their thematic evaluations when they're assessing specific development progress. Um, what I mean by that is that, for example, countries like Costa Rica, Colombia and Mexico have started to monitor and evaluate climate indicators across development, uh, while other countries have successfully done cross thematic evaluations that look at several areas of sustainable development, including climate as one of the themes. So climate is increasingly a theme of evaluations and uh, a focus of monitoring and evaluation or, or m and &E systems. Uh, although there is still an overwhelming focus on mitigation or reducing emissions and being climate smart, if you want, rather than also looking at adaptation or how we adapt to ongoing and to future climate risks. Um, mostly integrating climate risks into evaluations and recommendation is not happening very often systematically. So you have cases here and there, but you don't have a, a constant practice of doing it, especially not across all countries. And that really involves both uh, countries from uh, the, the, the global south and the global north. So in general, one of the problems is that, and echoing what Samson has mentioned uh, right before me, is that there's a lack of resources, both in terms of human resources within government evaluation teams, uh, but also a lack of resources in, some, in terms of financing um, to target the themes of, of climate in evaluation and the integration of climate risk. There is also a general lack of awareness and commitment at higher political levels that, that slows things down, really. Um, for example, in most countries, just like Kenya, governments decide uh, which are the priority programs and policies they want to evaluate on a yearly basis. So evaluation tends to be short-lived, and, and in that way, you have limited information that can be useful to predict future impacts, um, but also that can lead to having smaller political impact. I'm saying this, this is within governments, but it's also true at the international level from example, from large multilateral development institutions and climate and development funds uh, that are often funders of, of evaluations. Um, so in that sense, evaluations are often used for accountability reasons to justify how resources have been used rather than truly as a tool for adaptive management and learning. So, how can we address the fact that there is different progress across the board? I mean, it sounds like we need to be more systematic, don't we? What would be the first steps towards that, maybe? Yeah, you're right, Stefano. Uh, there is a need to be more systematic. And actually, the good news is that uh, 
just like some other aspects of re responding to the climate crisis, we do already have the necessary data, sources of knowledge and methods to understand climate risks and shocks. Uh, for examples, for, for example, national meteor meteorological agencies now have good climate data across a lot of countries, most countries, and enough projections. And the quality of Earth observations or satellite geospatial data is increasing every year. Uh, down to the community level, more and more people are aware and understand the impacts of climate on their communities and ecosystem. So we do have data and information, but the, block the blockage is changing the traditional evaluation approaches from looking primarily at retrospectively at impacts towards a more forward-looking uh, outset. In fact, evaluations are primarily looking back at what effects an intervention have had in order to recommend improvements in the future. But that premise doesn't really hold because of the uncertainty of climate changes and shocks, as Nick mentioned earlier. So the value of information of current evaluative approaches is limited, especially if climate risks are not considered. So the really first step for the new generation of evaluation is a need to focus on capturing how climate risks have affected progress or lack of progress in development, and then looking forward when doing the evaluation. So in a nutshell, evaluators need to change their thinking from what worked to what will work. Nick, can you tell us more about forward-looking methods? Sure, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, yeah, I think you raised a, a really good point there, Emily, about the use Wimble. We have a, a lot of uh, data that we can call on now, and and we need to start thinking about how we can use that data, that information about you know climate risks, about potential future changes and impacts um, to inform evaluations, but I think maybe more importantly to inform the um, activities that are being evaluated. And then the job of the evaluation is to ask how well those activities have actually incorporated that knowledge and that information and those data about climate change and climate change risks. Now, so, so that means that this, this can be pretty challenging for um, you know development, sustainable development uh, undertakings to, to actually develop a good understanding of climate change risks and to, to develop good ways of addressing them. It, historically, we've seen probably quite simplistic, deterministic approaches where people look at climate projections, a uh, narrow range of variables and say, OK, so we, we expect it's going to be on average about three degrees warmer and rainfall is going to decline by 10 to 20 percent by this date. Now, of course, climate change is sort of much more uncertain than that. We're very confident about changes in temperature, I think, uh, certainly at the global level and at the regional level, uh, and maybe more locally even. When, when it comes to things like rainfall and more complex hazards, uh, it's a lot more difficult to, to sort of look forward. So we have these emerging techniques, things like robust decision making, where you, you use climate projections um, to inform your thinking about risk, but you don't let them drive it. You think more about the conditions under which certain activities, processes, behaviours, systems fail and, and under which they succeed. And then you think about how likely these might be uh, to be met in the future uh, under climate projections, but also considering uh, unknown unknowns outside of the range of projections. So as you can probably tell, this can get very complicated very quickly. So while I think there's a is a central place for using climate information, climate data uh, in the programming of development actions and also to consider in evaluations the extent to which this has been done. There are also some other sort of more, more general things that we can look at as well if we're, if we're trying to do more forward-looking evaluations. There have been a number of uh, sets of principles developed for uh, guiding adaptation and for assessing adaptation. So we might look, for example, to the IID uh, principles for, for locally-led adaptation. We also have something that I worked on, um, again, with IID colleagues, and this is the so-called CAMELS framework. And CAMELS stands for Climate Adaptation, Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Systems. Yeah, so, so I think, again, just to summarise that rather convoluted explanation, um, yes, we can do forward-looking evaluation by either using or assessing the extent to which climate change data projections that have been used uh, in planning and project design. But we can also do this forward-looking uh, practice by you know, asking whether 
the thing that's being evaluated has adhered to certain key principles around, for example, use of science and uh, traditional knowledge, use of appropriate information, around transparency, participation, uh, equity, uh, and so on. So that is a very good and useful framework for practice, uh, Nick. And I was wondering what happened next then, Samson? What, what are the key next steps for Kenya? The, the, the next key steps for Kenya is to ensure that the evaluation culture is strongly entrenched in our system. And in fact, we already have a very strong uh, organization in Kenya called the Evaluation Society of Kenya, which is really uh, working closely with our directorate so that uh, we also give evaluators autonomy. You know, when you want to do evaluation of government programs, you cannot do it from internal uh, uh, platform. So you need to give us some independence of uh, people outside government to, to execute um, evaluation because then they, they, are, they are unpartisan. So we, are, we, we already have, we have the Evaluation Society of Kenya, which has uh, come out very strongly. And uh, it's really the body that will be uh, required to coordinate, yeah, of course, in, uh, in, in collaboration with us the selection of uh, uh, competent uh, evaluators, wherever they are, who can come and uh, do evaluation in specific sectors of the economy, particularly uh, the climate change issues that are now affecting us. So that's what we are doing, and uh, we believe that uh, we will be able to mobilize uh, resources in view that we already uh, have a policy in place of 1%, so ministries will have to put uh, 1% of their development budget to support evaluation programs so that uh, when evaluation is done, then nobody can reject it. So we are moving towards that direction and therefore evaluation is going to be a key thing. And we are even promo proposing that uh, for evaluation to take a top-notch uh, position in government, we are elevating uh, the Department of uh, Monitoring and Evaluation, which is within the National Treasury, to become semi-autonomous. And you know, when you are semi-autonomous, then you can now be able to do, uh, you can now work independently because we know the subject matter is not a popular uh, subject matter. You know, when you talk of evaluations, not everybody's amused about evaluation. So we want to have some independence. So that's, that's the direction we are moving to, and I believe we are soon getting there. Yeah, thanks, Samson. And Emily, in terms of supporting evaluators more broadly, what that means in terms of next steps? Yes, well, as Nick mentioned, there are a lot of resources available and, and data, but a lot of information is still spread across different sectors and, and, and sources. So it can be difficult for evaluators to start making sense of, of applying a new approach or rather a, a new outlook. That is why IAD will be publishing a guide to support a more systematic approach of how to integrate climate risks into evaluations. The guide will include an overview of key climate issues to take into account across sustainable development sectors or sustainable development goals, if you want. Um, but it will also include a higher level approach of how to use principles from the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and filter in climate issues and climate risks. So this will help evaluators use a new lens in their evaluation uh, but there will also be a step-by-step -step approach to help guide evaluators. Uh, there will be suggestions of questions to inform the evaluation. For example, we suggest moving from just asking, for example, if there is an evaluation about poverty and food security. Uh, has the program improved the livelihoods and food security of the most marginalized group? So additionally asking, have there been climate shocks and changes that have affected how livelihoods and food security improved or did not improve over the course of the intervention. But also we need to ask, how will a similar program need to be adapted to continue being relevant for the future marginalized group in light of future climate risks? So, and this report is really based on years of shared experience between the authors, new empirical research and collaborations with government evaluators like Samson. We're expecting the report to be launched shortly in 2022. So with that guide as a support, it sounds as if the process could be made more straightforward. But then what needs to happen to make this systemic change? More training, more money. Perhaps you don't like to tell us what you would prioritize and why. Samson first and then Emily and finally Nick. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, resources are important. Uh, you mentioned about resources. Resources still remain core. 
uh, EV evaluations have to be very, very effective. And I also need to mention that uh, one impediment uh, that perhaps I, I needed to have mentioned earlier is the fact that evaluation, you know, must be uh, evidence-based. And evidence evidence means data, uh, getting data that can help you combine an evaluation report. But the efficacy, the reliability, and the, 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 the timeliness of the data we are talking about may, may not be very easy to come by. And even the people you want to give you the sources of that information still requires to be, uh, it's an area that requires to be addressed because uh, sources of innovation, of, inf- of information, the type of information you are getting might not be a very easy uh, thing for you to be able to execute uh, a very credible evaluation process. So to me, that's an area that perhaps uh, we also require to, 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 to be looked at because uh, the source of information is very, very important. Thank you. Thanks, Samson. Emily, do you want to say something? Yes. Um, uh, I would very much agree with that, Samson. Uh, and it's also good to remember that evaluation needs to be done in collaborations to start creating effective changes. Just like uh, we need more than one source of data and knowledge to do cross-sectoral evaluations and direct climate issues, what I'd like to see happening more is collaboration and connections between institutions, between government departments and key decision makers. Information, but also policy making, is really siloed at the moment, and that prevents cross-learning, and that prevents really addressing climate risks. So collaborating between departments is the only way to understand the implication of the synergies and the trade-offs between different climate risks and different policy impacts. And also collaboration can help with sharing limited resources. Nick? Yeah, so building on what um, Emily and particularly Samson have said, I think this idea of like mandating evaluation is really important. And I think Kenya has some good precedent here. Uh, I think the other thing to you know, just reiterate is, that, and again, uh, Emily touched on this as well, evaluation processes need to be inclusive and they need to include diverse voices, particularly the voices of the people who are going to be affected uh, by the interventions we're evaluating. Um, and again, this goes back to addressing some of the risks and trying to ensure that, that these risks are considered and hopefully avoided. For example, risks of increasing the vulnerability of certain groups, uh, which are related to risks of displacement, exclusion, human rights abuses, and so on. So, you know, a sort of do, do no harm principle uh, demands that we, we take an inclusive approach. But I think more importantly, or at least as importantly, um, if we have inclusive and diverse voices, then we get a better picture of how well things are working on the ground. And that, that sounds sort of obvious and trite, but I think too often uh, that's not done. Um, and again, in the name of, of sustainable development, we have activities around things like conservation, uh, carbon offsetting and rewilding, uh, and there will be risks there that are analogous to these uh, risks of increased vulnerability. We hear a lot about people being excluded from areas on which they depend uh, in the name of these, these sorts of outcomes. So I think, again, inclusion is really important there. Uh, and I think finally, I think certainly training is critical. Uh, we need people who are designing interventions, but also the people who are evaluating those interventions to have a better understanding of climate risks and how consideration of climate risks can be integrated better into sustainable development planning, programming and activities. I think too much um, sustainable development and wider development activity fails to grapple with some of the really profound climate risks we're going to be facing uh, and is quite often limited to quite tokenistic sort of incremental adaptation, generalised resilience building, generalised conservation. And what we need to be looking at is how uh, climate change alters the dynamics of sustainable development and how we can ensure that development is sustainable in the face of climate change. I think just a sort of final word on this for me would be that um, if development isn't adaptive, if it doesn't incorporate adaptation to climate change, then it's not sustainable. And that's the bottom line. That's what I think evaluation of sustainable development with a climate change lens needs to grapple with. Okay, that's great, Nick. A bold statement and an excellent way to end our conversation. So thanks to all our guests, Samson Machoka. Thank you. Emily Busham. Thanks, Stefano. Nick Brooks. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sustainable Development Goals, Evaluating Progress for a Brighter Future. On the next episode, we discuss the process of defining the scope and focus of an evaluation.
something considered by many to be a major stumbling block to measuring progress against the Sustainable Development Goals. To find out more about this podcast, our guests and their organizations, visit the IID website, iid.org. See you next time.